Welcome to the Digital Insight, the official podcast series for CPO Strategy and Interface Magazines. Today, I'll be talking with Mohamed Kafil, Senior Product Manager at Procurement Software Provider, Kissflow. Today, Kafil and myself will be discussing how CPOs must harness agility and control through procurement technology. Yeah, thank you so much for giving us some of your valuable time today. Um, we really appreciate that. Sure. Andrew, uh, I am the product head of Kisflow Procurement Club, okay? And I'm also the head of uh, customer success, right? I am with Kisflow for almost uh, one and a half years now, prior to which I was with KPMG as a, a senior manager handling Procurement Cloud strategy and operations in the advisory department of KPMG. And prior to KPMG, I was with SAP Labs handling their uh, product management and customer success division in the procurement domain. And I am a procurement and supply chain professional for about uh, 13 years now. So I'm doing and I'm doing supply chain uh, since 2008. That, that's the background. Okay. Um, it's quite a CV there. Um, so, um, Procurement right now, I mean, it's obviously gone through um, a massive change, hasn't it, in recent years. Um, how would you kind of describe uh, procurement significance today? Um, because obviously it, it was at one time kind of considered a, a cost-saving back office function, wasn't it? But, but that has changed so much in recent times, hasn't it? It was, it was. In fact, uh you know, from where it began, you know, um, the early days of material management to where it is now, it is a, you know, a paradigm change, a generational shift in terms of where we are heading towards, right? Now, the procurement, which was traditionally seen as a back office function, is slowly moving towards a new category known as B2B commerce, Right. Uh, a, a technology, a method of operations, a method of commerce that connects an industrial buyer and an industrial uh, seller, right? Business to business commerce is where it is heading towards. And, um, uh, you know, it is one of the fastest growing e-commerce segments in the States and elsewhere in the world. So, uh, you know, procurement paradigm has changed totally from a back office operations into a strategic functionality that adds revenue that uh, sustains the production, right? And that, that is a core value addition to the whole company, manufacturing and sales, instead of, a, a, you know, an office that earlier find its refuge in a CFO's uh, wing, right? Yeah. I see. And, and obviously, um, like many uh, functions of a modern enterprise, um, it's been affected by digital transformation and some of the emerging technologies that have come around. Um, how, how, how important is technology right now to helping the modern CPO um, to do his or her job? I mean, uh, it has reached to an extent that without technology, if a CPO is performing his job, uh, the CPO needs to be changed. Uh, <laughs> it's a it, it may be a bold claim, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's the truth. Uh, that, that's what it is. Because without technology, you are relying on manual processes, uh, instinct-driven decisions, right? And a gut work of compliance, right? Uh, which may end you, lead uh, you to some kind of a legal troubles. You may put the whole brand at risk if you're not following ethical purchase practices, if you're not focusing on who your suppliers and supply chain are, right? And without technology, it is a an impossible endeavor for a human to keep track of all those thousands and thousands of data points and to arrive at a decision by, by moving papers is uh, almost unimaginable. We are talking about 1870s if somebody is performing such kind of an activity. <laughs> And of course, also, uh, even within um, a modern enterprise that is successfully harnessing technology, there's also 
the fact that um, companies and procurement functions obviously need to be more agile and, and have more um, visibility as well, don't they? Into their data and, and their supply. It is, it is. Uh, you know, the very word agility uh, defines that the ability to move swiftly, the ability to react swiftly. Now, the industry terminology of agile existed many years uh, from now, right? But the true meaning of what agile is was put to test during the pandemic times, right? Many organizations could not be agile enough to overcome, to recover, to regroup and re-strategize to secure their supplies and to ensure their businesses uh, to run, uh, you know, as, as business as usual, right? They were stuck. They couldn't get their feet back on the ground as soon as they hoped uh, to, right? And um, I, I wouldn't blame the entire thing on technology, but a major part of it is because their organizations were not ready for such a shock, right? They were not equipped to handle these things in a robust and a truly modern way of doing things, right? Now it is not an option anymore. You have to be agile, else you you are you, you are going to be shut down. You you are not going to be in the marketplace, right? So I I think that's where we are moving towards tech driven compliance, tech driven agility, tech driven you know future. Right, uh, I, I would be saying all the soft skills that we spoke about, all the cultures that we spoke about. Even now, if you look at agile, is more of a culture, right, um, uh, and 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 the process, right. Agile is not a tech, but from there we have gone into a period where agility is possible only through tech, right. You may have all the intents to be as flexible and as swift as possible, but without your um, you know aids. Uh, you, you can't achieve that. It'll only be an intention. It won't be fulfilled with the right without the right tools. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you mentioned COVID there. I mean, obviously, um, it's affected um, every element of, of society. Never mind uh, commerce or, or you know, the workings of an enterprise. What, what do you think were the were the biggest challenges that COVID um, uh, represented for CPOs and procurement? The supply shock is is the biggest challenge because, uh, you know, all on a sudden, uh, due to the globalization, um, you know, reasons, we, we all moved. Every country in the world moved their supply chains to the third world countries, the developing countries, the more efficient, uh, you know, production environments, right, which, which sat 10,000 miles across the globe, right? Now, all on a sudden, you found ships are, not, ships are not moving, right? People are not coming to office. People are not coming to factories. The downstream impact, right, is, is reflected in U.S. or in U.K. or in Middle East, right, across the globe, right? Now, it is one thing that COVID impacted your health. Your own people are not willing to come to office. Your own customers are not willing to step out of their homes, right? You may find a workaround. You may say that, you know, I, you know what, I can offer you home deliveries, right? You, you know what? I can offer you remote working environments, right? All that is possible. But what would you do if you don't have your raw materials, if you don't have your essential supplies, right? How will you make a product and how will you do the business, right? This is something that is unforeseen in the modern uh, enterprise era, at least for the last 200 years. Nothing of this sort happened, right? Uh, truly globalization was put to test. And uh, that's where the importance of strategic category management came into picture. The importance of nurturing local suppliers, nurturing women minority owned business enterprises, right? You know, understanding and assessing your supplier risk, right? Supply chain risk, right? Logistics risk. All these came into picture, into limelight after the COVID situation, because, you know, one more such shock, uh, you know, we will, um, you know, truly be in the turbulent mode uh, without uh, without being prepared for it. Yeah, and, and I guess also um, uh, sustainability comes into this as well, doesn't it? Because to some degree now, that's the other big issue that a lot of CPOs are grappling with um, in terms of um, trying to make sure that their uh, practices are sustainable and in fact that their suppliers are adhering to the same codes of practice. Um, so that kind of visibility, if you like, through um, 
some of the technology that's able to um, you know give us insight into into those kind of workings is vital right now. It is. It is. In fact, Andrew, I, I would like to add more to it. It is not just pandemic driven, right? The buyers are exposing themselves to all sort of litigation, all sort of image brand related risks if they do not know who their suppliers are. Maybe there is a factory that a buyer hasn't even seen in his entire life is employing an unethical labor practice, is paying below you know, minimum wages, right? And suddenly the news breaks out, right? And the whole brand takes a hit, right? People are uh, conscious in terms of ESG, the environmental, social, governance related practices of a company, right? And uh, that, that, is, that is becoming mainstream now. It is no more a pipe dream. People are conscious in terms of who they are buying from, who they are enabling business for. And if those businesses are not ethical enough, environmental enough, social enough, right, they are shutting down the businesses. They are shunning their brands and moving towards a more ethical, a more home-driven, uh, you know, conscious-driven businesses, right? I think it is the job of a buyer uh, evolve from, you know, the job of a buyer is not savings-driven anymore. The job of a buyer is evolved much more than that. It is to find supplier partners, right? Find out suppliers, nurture them, co-innovate with them, ensure compliance for the suppliers on behalf of the buyer, you know, much more engaging, much more multidimensional than the unidimensional aspect of price, right? It's, it's no more price, right? People are okay to pay a couple of cents extra for an organic product or a bamboo fabric, right? That, that's because they, are, they, they all are conscious about what they use, what they consume, all of that, yes. That's the future is. And, and would you say uh, procurement now really seen more as a, as, a, as a business partner, really? Well, uh, th there are different kind of needs based on the business sizes for a small enterprise where they do not have the scale where they do not have the knowledge, they expect the procurement to be a business partner. And that kind of businesses are emerging as well. Community sourcing is happening. Your tail spend is handled by Amazon businesses, right? Where procurement, not as a software, but procurement as a service is provided to, uh, you know, the smaller businesses, right? Because they can't afford to have an in-house GPO office, right? So, there are outsourced businesses that are taking care of these things. Then there's something like value addition and procurement where a lot of mid-market, a lot of uh, location-driven businesses that, that are not easily scalable like a hotel, hospital, care delivery centers, right? They see procurement as a value addition, um, you know, uh, partner where they want procurement to help them do things faster, better, and cheaper right driven by automation driven by technology whatever uh, you know whatever latest additions that you want to call it as right there are enterprises much larger enterprises you're talking about the companies in the scale of adidas nike and you know um, staples and much larger enterprises they are focused on a, a bigger paradigm which is the esg environmental social and governance related partnership right so i i wouldn't say it is unidimensional for for a struggling startup, they can't really be focused on ESG. They, they would like to outsource it to the best available provider out there, right? So the needs of procurement varies as per the industries and as per the size of the industries that you operate in. But pretty much you can sum it up all into the, you know, ESG related, the value addition, automation related, and the outsourcing related uh, service offerings. Yes. And, and we, we mentioned earlier um, the importance of agility and control, um, right? Um, procurement technology. Um, how does a how does a how do how do we achieve that? If you like, you know, how, how's yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I was saying, uh, I was saying the same to somebody else in my office. The word, the definition of agility is to react, to move fast, right? And the word control is to do things in a measured fashion, in a compliant fashion, right? It's a, it's a, it's 
opposite to each other. You you can't have agility and control in the same sentence in a manual process, uh, in a in a in a traditional way of doing things, right? The only way you can achieve agility that is also compliant is by tech. You can automate uh, your uh, procure to order and your invoice to payment operations within the tolerance of policies, within the limits of policy, within the limit of what uh, your company wants to spend for the year or for the category or for the department, right? Uh, and, and with the specific supplier group, right? Uh, the, you know, order distribution, the volume distribution to multiple suppliers, right? All those policy compliance is achieved by the technology. Parallelly, the technology also provides efficiency, faster cycle times, faster reaction times, right? And if you're a large company that operates in multi locations, in a, in a click of a button, all your new policies and all your automations can be rolled out hand in hand thanks to the tech, right? So, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of the changes that the, the new world brought in. Uh, technology and control can coexist and can be achieved, uh, right, uh, with, with the new systems and, and, and uh, tools. And, and how does a how does a company like uh, Kissflow? How does that how can they help procurement um, functions to, um, to to function in the modern world, if you like? Um, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, a company like Kissflow at its at its essence, what they do is they democratize technology, right? They they take a complex technology piece like uh, procure to pay, source to pay, which is accessible only to enterprises that were willing to spend millions in the IT spend, right? And, and dedicate a whole lot of departments, divisions to, to, to handle these. Only those kind of companies had access to these complex tech, right? Now, what Caseflow does is Caseflow takes it, simplifies it, puts it on a cloud, right? Uh, and, and says that you can have access to the same complex, efficient, advanced technologies for a fraction of cost, right? For a fraction of uh, what the what these uh, enterprises are offering to, uh, you know, the, the big market, the large, the large consumers, right? We're doing the same to the SMBs, small and medium-sized enterprises, right? We host the technology on cloud so that you don't have to do any kind of on-premise implementation. Now, of course, there are many technology, uh, P2P technology providers that are cloud-based, but they're not as complex as we are. They, they you know, they, they, they provide some basic functionalities. They do not provide an um, end-to-end automation, fully suite integrated functionality at the price range and at the value range that, uh, you know, the time to value that we offer is also less than four weeks, right? So you, you, you do not have to shell out a six month project plan to do the same thing that we would do in say four, four to four to five weeks max tops, right? So that that's what we do, right? We 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 offer technology in procure to order and invoice to payment, where the procure to order part is fully focused on efficiencies and automation, with the help of catalogs, supplier onboarding, and uh, setting up uh, budgets, setting up uh, autom automated user restrictions, right? What a user can and cannot do. And then it helps you with the workflow, the approval flows, right? With the management hierarchy so that the entire purchase to order process can happen digitally and as fast as possible, right? Now, we go one step further in the downstream, the invoice to payment process, which is once the supplier sends you the invoice, and you have to pay them the cash, they pay them the money, right, as per the payment term, we aim to automate as much as possible to the tune of 85, 90%, right? And keep the remaining 10% with as limited touch points as possible. Only, you know, for example, if you have 100 invoices, 90 goes automatically approved and paid to the supplier without a human touch. And the remaining 10%, right, is, still requires touch, but as minimal touch as possible. Right, that that's that's what we are offering in the upstream and downstream strike. 
On the parallel side, we are also offering sourcing, the strategic sourcing and contract uh, management uh, modules, right, which is the genesis of the whole P2P operations, right, where we allow, uh, you know, an RFQ, RFI, RFP processes to get the best prices from the supplier, to compare the prices, to compare the savings, right, evaluate and award the contract to the best supplier who's selected not based on price alone but on other parameters like how they are rated what is their first time uh, you know success rate what is the quality of their produce all that parameters are considered into picture and then a system recommends to whom to award this to right so all, all th this is what case flow does so essentially we enable agility control and savings right the roi right uh, th there are many types of software, right? Software that that is mandated by the government. You, you need this so that you're not sued by the government for something that you're missing, right? You, you need this so that you can do things better, right? But there are other kind of software where you do an investment and the software pays for itself, right? Like a real cash, not, not some fictional cash. You invest it, you realize the savings, and you realize that you got the software for free, right? The ROI is less than one year, right? In case of Kissflow, we we kind of check all three boxes. We offer you futuristic, agile, compliant software that is also scalable, customizable, right? Kissflow is a, a low-code platform, right? Uh, for, for your audience who do not know what a low-code is, it is like ServiceNow. It is like with the citizen developers, with a drag and drop interface you can build your own applications if you if you want it so essentially you can expand the scope of our procurement cloud suit as much as you want and as deep as you want right with as minimal time as it takes to roll out right uh, and and as i said earlier our, our software also provides the best roi which is less than one year's time frame you, you pay something you pay an x dollar be sure to recover your X dollars in less than nine months, one year, yeah. And what, what do you think um, makes uh, Kissflow's offerings um, unique today when compared to maybe some of your competitors? Okay, so we are unique in multiple friends. If if I have to say what, what we are truly unique about, I would not say our price point, right? Uh, because in, in our mind, we offer value and we charge for the value that we offer. We, we charge judiciously. We do not charge exorbitantly because that is not what we stand for as a company. But what we are truly unique about, what, what's unique about us is our ability to customize, our ability to extend the solution. For long, on-premise solutions were preferred over cloud because on-premise offers you limitless customization possibilities. And cloud traditionally meant that it is an opinionated software. A cloud software will tell you what is the right way to do things. And your process, your company should follow what I determine as a business process, right? Because the software, uh, the traditional cloud software cannot be customized company to company right? It's immaterial how unique the activity is and how, uh, you know, indie market that, that whole thing is or how creative the offering is whole thing is. They, they're they're going to say, okay, you know what? You can be as creative as all, all you want to be, but you have to follow the standardized process that we set because our software can do only that, right? And that's what cloud meant all these days, right? But we are a platform, and we are not just a platform, we are a low-code platform. And we are not just a low-code platform, we are also a no-code platform, right? So, which means in one platform, you can do anything that you want. You, you want to build a HR uh, application, user management application, and integrate that function to procure a temp labor or a contingent workforce, right? You can extend the solution, right? You want to plug in the admin department and say that, you know what, now I want to handle the travel and expense management. You can do so. You can extend the solution by simply dragging and dropping a couple of fields or coming to us. If it is a little more complicated, 
you know, we will be able to develop that in a low-code application. What low-code means is, uh, you know, from, from ideation to deployment, we are talking about weeks, not years, right? You, you're not going to get an answer that says, this feature is not with us. We are planning it in the next 20th roadmap, right? Somewhere down the line, we are going to launch it for you. That is not an answer Kissflow is going to give you, right? We, we are going to take something. We are, going to re- we are going to take a requirement from you and fulfill that in weeks, right? So th- that kind of extensibility is uh, an unheard uh, paradigm in a cloud software all this way. Um, and we mentioned earlier, um, you know, how, how much procurement has changed as a function, um, some of the challenges that COVID and sustainability have, have put to CTOs. Um, what do you think are going to be the, the biggest challenges for procurement, you know, over the next you know, year, two, three years? You know, what, what kind of trends do you see coming that, that are going to change the way in which technology functions and, in fact, the way that procurement functions? Well, I think the reverse globalization is going to happen. With pandemic, people are not going to risk their supply chains into, a, you know, a distant land, right? They are going to want to retain some element of a captive center-based development or production or an in-house, inland production or an alternative. So I think the real challenge is going to be finding, nurturing, incorporating and co-innovating a new supply base that provides the same efficiency as an offshore supplier is going to be the real real challenge in the next upcoming years right and that's for the and that's for the procurement offices that are already in the forefront right now that's just 20 percent of the whole b2b commerce market the remaining 80 percent of b2b commerce still prefers cash edi based you know, all the eight trillion, seven trillion worth of B two B commerce is not uh, performed on procurement. It is performed on manual operations, cash heavy operations, and paper heavy operations. Right. So there are different enterprises, different markets that are on different levels of maturity. Right. For a mature organization, getting a new supplier, supply discovery is going to be the bigger challenge in the upcoming years. Right. And for an unmatured uh, org, an unmatured enterprise, an org restructure, an org reprioritization, establishing a CPO's office in first place is going to be the bigger challenge. Finding the right uh, process, finding the right policy, finding the right people, finding the right technology is going to be the bigger challenge, right, for an enterprise, mid-market. And for a small vendor, they are going to look at, they are going to need to discover an ecosystem of application because they can't keep spending for IT and time and money every three months. They're, gonna, they're, they're not going to enter into a digital transformation for every department, right? They are going to need a platform-like solution that takes care of the whole IT uh, workbench or IT platform or IT control tower that, that kind of fulfills all of their uh, tech requirements is going to be, you know, the SMB's challenge point, right? Because it's not just the money. Maybe, you know, an SMB is successful and fast growing, but if they have to keep investing time and not focusing on their core business, once in three months, they're going to have to embark on a six-month journey to to transform a department, That that's not going to help. Right, that's uh, that's still silos. Instead of doing things in paper, you're doing things in in a system, but still, it's not truly a connected commerce work workspace. Right, that that's going to be the challenge for SMBs. Yeah.